gentlemen welcome to running continually uninterrupted cme number 862 for 862 weeks 862 weeks over to dr pigan yes sir good evening friends we have an interesting topic of cough and the cough doesn't get better you know cough can be passed off <coughs> as just a khansi like but the problem lies when the cough doesn't get better and you have to make a diagnosis why this cough is there most often it is allergic cough part of cough variant asthma or it can be bronchial asthma but you have to think beyond at times interstitial pulmonary fibrosis can be cause of cough at times it is it is gerd जी एट टाइम इट इज आर्डर कॉल ऑफ कॉफ सो डॉक्टर प्रशांत सक्सेना इज बी टॉकिंग अबाउट डिफरेंट एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ कॉफ हाउ टू एड्रेस द द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट एट टाइम द कॉफ ऑफ आईपीएफ कैन बी मैनेजमेंट कॉफ द पेशेंट टेल्स कि मेरे को इस खांसी से निजात दिला दो एंड वन ऑफ माय पेशेंट आई हैव इवन ट्राइड एलेडोमाइड बट ओनली गॉट हेल्प द पेशेंट वेरी वेल लॉस्ट सो कॉफ कैन बी वेरी डिस्ट्रेसिंग Let us hear more about it. Doctor Prashant Saxena, I think he has uh, done so many things with us. Presently, the director of Pulmonology Critical Care at Fortis Pasanti, Doctor Prashant Saxena. Thank you, sir, and thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be part of the forum again, and uh, I must congratulate all the forum members along with Doctor Chawan. and other dignitaries who have been so enthusiastic and attentive in the cmes i probably have i think around 13 or 14 cmes organized with this group so that is a small achievement for my side and uh, so <coughs> the reason why i chose this topic because every second day or every week you must be getting a call any doctor can get a call from anyone maybe the neighbor or maybe you know a relative ye bhaiya khansi nahi ja rahi hai kab kya karna hai so this is very important to understand for everyone every physician that if a cough is not going then what to think should we directly send it to a physician and forget it no so just a classical this is a classification We studied acute cough, subacute cough, and chronic cough. Acute cough is up to three weeks. Subacute cough three to eight weeks, and chronic cough more than eight weeks. On the basis of this, they used to classify various diseases. But now this classification is only a of historical importance because many of the mismatches or mix and matches are there. The important thing to remember in this is that if i will make it very simple that a cough which happens can be due to anything these are the receptors of cough which are in the larynx supralarynx trachea bronchi ear canal pleural pleura pericardium diaphragm esophagus stomach so this is the location of the cough receptors in the body and any of these triggers can cause cough so once you have stimulation of these receptors through the vagus nerve it goes to the medullary center which integrates the stimulus it integrates that cough stimulus is coming to me and then it directs the three nerves spinal nerves pineal nerve and vagus nerves which then cause the cough through expiratory muscles diaphragm and larynx trachea and bronchi and that's how you cough so this is a simple diagram of cough reflex so you have to remember that not every cough arises from the lungs common triggers we must be aware there can be common triggers heat cold chemicals acid reflux is common pollution smoke dust so apart from the common conditions you should be able to have a differential diagnosis that is it a infection is it a common cold is it a exacerbation of asthma bronchitis copd is it a reflux is it a post nasal drip is this cough a prolonged viral syndrome is it a viral bronchitis bronchitis reactive airway dysfunction syndrome i come to this 
tuberculosis, cancer, ID. These are all also common. Sometimes a character of cough is important. For example, if you have a cough which is worse in the morning, it can be due to COPD. If you have a cough which is worse at night, it is due to asthma. If you have a barking cough, it is likely due to laryngitis. So asking a patient about the character of cough is very important. Sometimes the cough can be associated with hemopsis, which can be due to tuberculosis, a throat infection, or can be cancer. So always take a good history. This is something which is very important nowadays, irritants induced asthma or reactive airway dysfunction syndrome. This is the asthma which results from single exposure of a high concentration of irritant or repeated exposure to small doses of irritant, which means we are living already in a zone where we are continuously exposed to such irritants. And it is easily manageable with bronchodilator and steroids. Sometimes we take all the histories except for the post nasal drip syndrome. One of the most common causes of cough or chronic cough or subacute cough is a post nasal drip syndrome or a upper airway cough syndrome. Which means that there are secretions in the nose which accumulate in the throat and cause cough. And we must take the history of common cold, rhinitis, sinusitis and also environmental exposures. The good thing is that when you are examining the patient, you look at the pharynx, there is a cobblestone appearance of the pharyngeal mucosa. So you can make out that this could be a post nasal drip. So always examine the upper airway of the patient. This is very common, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I think my gastroenterology uh, colleagues would agree to me that 40%, 30 to 40% of the patients of gastroesophageal reflux disease do not present with typical symptoms of heartburn, dyspepsia. They present with a chronic cough. So, a cough, please take history of such issues. <coughs> the clinching point is that the patient will do frequent throat clearing. <coughs> they will always come like this. A cough which is worse in the morning, a voice which changes in the morning, and after eating you have a cough. This is a clinching point towards a gastroesophageal reflux disease. There is something which is also known as a meningopharyngeal reflux, which means that basically you have got two sphincters in the esophagus. One is the upper esophageal sphincter and one is the lower esophageal sphincter. GRD is a problem of the lower esophageal sphincter, which means that once you lie down, you have a cough. But in meningopharyngeal reflux, you have a problem with the upper esophageal sphincter, which means you are coughing when you are sitting down. So this is important that we have to understand. You can examine the upper airway again. You will have arytenoid. All these edema will be there in the upper airway. So don't confuse it with the infection. I frequently see my colleagues looking at the throat. Ki badi lal lal ho hai, isko antibody ke do. But there could be a big amount of reflux in that problem. Ace inhibitors we know commonly prescribed for hypertensives. <coughs> The clinching point is that in patients who have a ACE inhibitor cough, they will have a tickling sensation in the throat. And usually the cough starts within a week after starting the anti <coughs> Sorry. And it will resolve within a week to four weeks after stopping. So that way you can judge. Pneumonia we know. I will not go into the details. <coughs> now this was a problem with which for which I got a lot of calls in the H1N1 era, in the COVID era. Doctors calling me that my patient's cough is not going after a COVID or a flu. And uh, we have been giving antibiotics for six weeks, four weeks. And then it actually became an entity. Studies came which told us that there is something which is known as a post-infectious cough which usually happens after a seasonal viral infection and the cough can linger on for weeks and the important thing is that 50% of these patients don't require any treatment it will just go unless you have a very distressing cough you give them cough syrup something and that's it nothing else needs to be done but you have to examine the patient and understand that it is really a post infection as well we know the reason why I mentioned as well is that there is a significant proportion of patients 
I'm sorry, I'm also having a cough. So, my theology is the recent visit to Sri So, uh, I'm aware of that. So, in this patient of cough variant asthma, the cough may be the sole manifestation of the problem. The patient will keep on coughing, 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 coughing in bouts. And then you have to take the history because gradually these patients progress to develop a full blown asthma. So it is important to take the history, identify the triggers, and it is managed like an asthma patient. Chronic <coughs> bronchitis, you know, we are living in a zone which is full of pollution, which has got dust, fumes, exposure. Some people are working in the industry. And chronic exposure to dust, fumes can lead to a inflammation of the airway, which can lead to chronic bronchitis. Now, one or two important points that sometimes we look at the x-rays, x-ray may be normal looking and the patient is coughing. But we all, always should look at what is behind. And in this patient, I did a CT scan and I found a bilateral lower lobe infiltrate with a normal looking x-ray and found out to be a H1N1 pneumonia in the end. Similarly, again, a very normal looking CT, uh, sorry, x-ray, something was there in the upper lobes so we did a <coughs> CT scan. CT scan you can see upper lobe pharyngeal infiltrates were there. Then <coughs> we thought it could be a malignancy. Then we did a PET scan and again there were lymph nodes and fibronodular patches. After which we did a series of investigations including EBUS and other things. <coughs> the only thing which we found was that there was fibrosis and inflammatory cells in the slice. We have seen the patient, only one thing we missed, the occupation of the patient. Patient was a worker in a cement industry and he was having a fibrosis secondary to silica. So history is of utmost importance. You can miss these simple cases just because of history. Again, a normal looking x-ray, you can see x-ray looks normal and then we did a CT scan. So it is dependent on how you examine because this patient was having some crepes in the base and we did a CT and it turned out to be a pneumonia. So don't get too much, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> confused that you have a normal looking x-ray so the lungs can be normal. <coughs> These are the list of causes where you have a normal looking x-ray but the patient has a problem. And this is asthma, GRD, post-nasal drip, smoking, irritants, drugs and so many things. Sleep apnea, foreign body. Then again, uh, a very interesting case, a patient came to me after having a cough. Five days of cough and <clears throat> no history, nothing. Then I looked at the... Have I done this? So, I looked at the x-ray. I found something was scanned. Again, this thing was showing up here. We couldn't find out what exactly this was. And then we took the history, the patient said we made a dental procedure was a passing pellet. And it was a five minute procedure and here go, here go. But then we thought this is something which is there and then we went inside, we did a bronchoscopy and when we took out this one. This is a orodental file, endodontic file, which they use for root canaling and the patient actually aspirated it and there was no knowledge of, to the patient also and the doctor also. But these things can happen. You just have a cough with this. Especially for last molar tooth, when they extract, are there chances of money? So, uh, my few uh, final slides. Uh, <clears throat> don't just keep on giving them anti allergics. Some tips. I have seen patients on six months of Monte LC. Uh, cough syrups, cough is not going. So don't just keep on giving them these, uh, you know, drugs. They are all dangerous drugs. They have, they have side effects. Take history examination. Problem can be outside the lungs. Think about that it can be outside the lungs. And early, early intervention. You should be able to convince the patient to get a CT scan, PFT, ECO, and then find out what is the problem. <coughs> Treat the primary problem, not the symptom. If you have a cough, don't give them cough syrup and anti allergic Find out why this patient is having a cough. Because this can become a big problem for the patient. 
and intervention planning should be early. If you know that the patient requires an intervention, then please refer the patient to get the proper intervention and don't let them self-medicate. Over-the-counter antibiotics, cough syrups, anti-allergics, yes, every patient. I have seen patients coming to my OPT doctor, I have taken Cephuroxin, Augmented, I have taken the Dazzin, I have taken the Dazzin, I have taken the Dazzin, I have taken the Dazzin. So this is how they are presenting to us and it makes our life miserable. Because I immediately understand this patient has googled all the things and is now trying to find out what is the cause. But we know how to deal with these patients. <coughs> Their diets also. They will ask you thousands of questions. Katta ni gana, mita ni gana, dahi ni gana, ye ni gana. You have to convince them that there are some diets which are dangerous to you and you can eat anything because bachpan se dhuz ki te aayo, saath saath ki umar na dhuz se problem nahi ho sakti. You have to convince them. Ek bachpan se dahi gaya hai, ab saath saath ki umar mein, saath saath ki umar mein, aapko dahi se problem nahi ho sakti. You have to make them comfortable and understand that their misconceptions have to be removed. Food is not always there in a cough or a, any other throat problem. Vaccinations, N95 masks, they are all important. And uh, so, breathing exercise, they will also ask you, Dr. Shah, what do you exercise to do? Do you exercise to do? Do you exercise to do? You have to do deep breathing exercise. This is a simple answer. And they can just Google the breathing exercises. The, the thousands of breathing exercises which come, you tell them just follow what is there. Because I have checked it. They are convincing exercises. So this is what my take is. Any chronic cough, you should look at the patient, examine the patient, quit smoking. And uh, if you are not well, please get yourself checked up. Avoid exposure to pollutants including smoke, smoking. And exercise to breathe harder. Don't exercise to become muscular, but exercise to breathe harder. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. I think we will have question also session after the end of all time. So I tried to finish in time. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, different You could stay for some time. I'll try this. Uh, good evening friends, uh, so today we will be, from the nephrology team, we will be talking about stage 5 chronic kidney disease. So, stage 5 chronic kidney disease, as you all know, is EGFR less than 15. And there are only two treatments that will allow you to stay alive, that is dialysis or transplant. You go into the social media, yes, you will find plenty of treatments. There is also on Sunday, if you are spend some time on the TV, there's a program called Stop Kidney Dialysis. Mm. But I think that's the reason we are discussing this here. So that all of us can uniformly counsel our patients confidently in a single voice. That there are only two treatments between dialysis and transplant, and which is better? Uh, we have Dr. Sanshiti telling you, but I'll start with just a small intro that there is no doubt now that in 2023, kidney transplant is the gold standard for stage 5 chronic kidney disease. It's a, with a few exceptions, we can take it up later on. Uh, transplant is risky and I always tell my patients that, this is a quote from a famous transplant uh, surgeon, that kidney transplant is like marriage. It means benefits for many, curse for some, but risks for all. <laughs> so I want to substitute to this, uh, tell about uh, dialysis versus kidney transplant. <laughs> so kidney transplant is like marriage. Benefits for most or many. Curse for some. Risk for all. That's experience. <laughs> Dear friends, I have the pleasurable duty to invite and to present you the gem of our gem, <laughs> Dr. Chauhan ki gem family ki budding gem, Dr. Sansriti. <laughs> I asked what's the meaning, she told it's a beautiful creation of God and she is really so. 
and uh, I won't go more into, I think uh, it is three, four pages of uh, uh, introduction. I will concise in two, three lines, says one of us now and uh, we know Dr. Chauhan, so we know her also from the very beginning. She, he has been posting about her progress when she was appearing in uh, Nephrology. She talked, had a gold medal and uh, she has done a lot in academics. 44 uh, publications I, I came to know about her. Big hand for her. With a, such a tender age and so much of uh, uh, stamina to write and to progress. So her interest is more in transplantation, uh, of renal transplantation as uh, Dr. Gulati uh, has been her mentor and guide. So we will listen from her what is new and what, what we have to take home. Welcome. So, hello everyone, uh, my very first talk here. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin with the pertinent question. End stage kidney disease, should you go for dialysis or should you counsel your patients for getting a renal transplant? Uh, I have made, answer has made a very bold claim that there is absolutely no dearth of data now to support this claim that transplant is the superior modality uh, of treatment when it comes to end stage kidney disease for most patients and in the next few slides over the next 15 minutes I would like to prove my claim with some hard evidence. So just the problem statement in India, uh, as sir said end stage kidney disease is a GFR less than 15 mils per minute and uh, for the layman it, it would be a stage where without renal replacement therapy that is without dialysis or transplant survival is impossible and improbable. So the prevalence of ESRD requiring transplant stands at around 150 to 230 per million population and if you take an average of these figures approximately 2 lakh end stage kidney patients require transplant in our country annually. And against this, we are doing only 7,500 kidney transplant at 250 transplant centers, majority of which are private sector, very few public sector. Now transplant can be living donor kidney transplant and disease donor kidney transplant. Delhi uh, and majority of North India unfortunately cannot boast of a very prominent cadaver kidney donation program. So 90% of kidneys come from living donors and 10% from disease donors. So now that we know the problem statement, why even choose transplant over dialysis? I'd like to talk a little bit about patient survival on dialysis versus transplant, followed by how over the last five decades we've been able to make progress in terms of allograft survival, that is the kidney survival, so the theme one kidney for life and patient survival. And then improved outcomes where it is needed most, which is diabetic patients, elderly patients, ABO incompatible transplants, and people who are getting transplants for the second time, so most often pediatric patients, when they outlive the life of their uh, first transplant. And then towards the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about how quality of life improves and what matters most to all of us, including our patients' money. So we end the discussion with a cost-benefit analysis. Now, uh, just about over a year ago, this uh, excellent meta-analysis came out and I'm not going to bore you with the details of the meta-analysis, but it compared over 1.2 million patients of end-stage kidney disease who either remained on dialysis or received a transplant. And what was astounding was that transplant was associated with a 55% lower long-term mortality when you compared it to dialysis. And this was data from over 1.2 million people. Some hard numbers that you can explain in your OPD to patients. So majority of ESRD or end stage kidney patients you get in India are diabetics, uh, nearly one half. And if a diabetic goes on dialysis, their survival, five year survival is a measly 30%. Whereas when the same patient undergoes a transplant, they can now boast of a life, they can now have a survival of 75 to 80 percent. 
and this is true for India as it is for the Western world. Now, once we talk about patient survival, it is also important to talk about graft survival. So, while we want to fulfill our hypothesis of one kidney for life, we have yet not been able to achieve that. But we've made a very uh, significant progress in terms of how long the kidney is now surviving. In fact, the majority improvement is now noted in the highest risk groups, that is diabetics and people over the ages of 60 who want to get their first transplant. So whether we talk about mortality, which is a survival, so when you look at survival statistics, whether you talk about short term survival, which is the blue dotted line here, which is just the one year survival, or you talk about long term survival up to 10 years, you can see that the rate of death is declining across the, uh, over the two decades, that is between the late 90s to the early 2000s. And this is true for both people who receive a living kidney or a cadaver kidney. Similarly, the graft survival has improved significantly over the last 20 years. So the rate of allograft loss is declining. I'll put the numbers into perspective in the next slide. So if you have to tell your patients in the OPD, uh, you know, some hard numbers, how long will the kidney survive if I get a transplant? How long will I survive? What are my chances? The 10 year patient survival is nearly 80% on uh, with a transplant. That is to say that if there are 100 end-stage kidney patients, at the end of 10 years, 80 after a transplant will still be alive. Whereas if these 100 people were to undergo dialysis, only 20 will be alive at the end of 10 years. When you talk about graft survival, it was somewhere around 50% 20 years ago, which is only 50% kidneys would survive this 10 year period, others would reject. But now with modern immunosuppression, nearly 70% living donor kidneys are still functioning at the functioning and functioning well at the end of 10 years. Similar uh, improvement has been noted for cadaver kidneys, although not to the extent for living donor transplants. So 10 year patient survival has gone up from 60 to 70% and the kidneys are now at least 50% kidneys survive the 10 year mark. When you talk about patient survival, a question often posed to nephrologists, to transplant physicians and maybe even to general physicians is, if I get a transplant, how much do of, of life do I get in addition to what I have? So the median survival 20 years ago for a cadaver uh, recipient was somewhere around 8 to 9 years, which has now increased to 12 years. And for a living donor kidney recipient, the median survival now is 20 years after their transplant. What is interesting and inspiring is that these improvements have occurred despite the unfavorable change in both the donor and recipient characteristics. So if you look at the donor and the recipient demographics, they are both now uh, both increasing donor age and increasing recipient age. Donor and recipients are both now increasingly being diagnosed with overweight and obesity. Longer dialysis vintage, which means people spend more time on dialysis, so they uh, go for a transplant after being on dialysis for 2, 3, 4, 5 years. And uh, because of the improvement in uh, the modality of dialysis, they do not accrue as much damage uh, caused by dialysis as people over a decade ago. And then just uh, we as nephrologists accepting more and more peer donors with pre-diabetes and even diabetes and majority of our recipients are already diabetes. The next important question which is often, uh, often comes to the mind of nephrologists as well as to general physicians is, we all know that in general population the burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is on the rise. Dialysis patients have a 400 times more chance of having ASCVD than the general population. So, in dialysis patients who have had an acute coronary event or have history of CAD, is it wise to choose transplant given cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in post-transplant patients? And I have data here to suggest from, which was just recently came out uh, in 2023, where maintenance hemodialysis patients with uh, obviously end-stage kidney disease patients were randomized to staying on dialysis versus getting a transplant. And they were followed for 10 years and what you see is a very wide divergence of curves which means that people who got a transplant had a significantly lower mortality over the next 10 years as well as a recurrent MACE event over the next 10 years 
versus if they were to stay on dialysis. So even in people who have had an MI, who have had heart disease, the choice of renal replacement remains transplant. Another important question, and I believe this is the most important question when it comes to me delivering this talk to you, is when to refer patients for transplant. When is transplant the ideal modality of choice? Anybody with an eGFR less than 15 has end stage. So when should you refer them to us and when should you start counselling them about a transplant? So preemptive transplant is the superior modality versus elective transplant. And by preemptive transplant I mean that the patient never has to undergo a dialysis. Which means that if the eGFR is less than 10, the patient can straight away proceed for a transplant and the sooner this patient is referred to us, the earlier the transplant workup gets completed and the sooner the patient gets transplanted. And in fact, it is important because preemptive transplant has significantly better outcomes than people who have stayed on dialysis for a period of time and then they undergo a transplant. So the bottom line is refer patients early to us. Another important question. Now, we all know that with modern medicine, we are increasing lifespan and the average age of people starting dialysis is usually in their 5th or 6th decade now. So, people in their 50s or 60s are now just starting dialysis. So, the question which will come in your mind as it did in mine when I was doing my first year residency was that uh, with increasing age, do transplant outcomes become worse? And is age a contraindication to transplant? And the answer is a hard no. So this is not just data, this is also clinical experience that in older age, and so older age is relative. For people in the US it's above 70, for people in India it would be above 60. Transplanting them first, which means preemptive transplant, is the modality of choice. Do not put them on dialysis because just preemptive transplant can almost double their lifespan. And there is clear data now to suggest that with transplant first and dialysis later, you can lower the mortality by almost 40%. Five year survival rates for somebody over 70 undergoing their first transplant is 80%. Whereas five year survival rate on dialysis is just 50% for people over the age of 70. The reason I bring this up is because age is often considered a contraindication from your side and from my side and the major reluctance is on the part of clinician to refer people for transplant or even counsel them for transplant whereas I am here to tell you that age is not at all a contraindication in fact data suggests quite the opposite Unfortunately, there is very little Indian data because we don't have registries in India. We spend much more time in the clinics and very little time is devoted to good quality research. It is unfortunate that India is probably one of the leading nations to do living donor kidney transplants, yet we do not have a nationwide registry and nothing to compare transplant and dialysis outcomes in India. What we do have is a beautiful study that came out of CMC Valor where they compared uh, around 3,000 transplants over, done over four decades and what they found out was quite similar to what is reported in international registries which is a graft survival rate that is the kidney uh, how many kidneys are functioning at the end of one year so nearly 90% at the end of one year 80% at the end of three years and 75% at the end of five years when you talk about the progress we've made over the last four decades, so in the 70s, the probability that either you would survive or the kidney would survive was only 40%. Five-year survival rates were only 40%. And they've increased to nearly 90% now in the early 2000s. I'd now quickly move on to the quality of life. So the most important benefit I feel the transplant has, the leverage transplant has over dialysis is this sense of perceived freedom. You don't have to go to a hospital, you don't have to be hooked up to a machine thrice a week and you, at least initially the hospital visits are infrequent in transplant. I'm sorry, later the transplant, uh, in hospital visits are infrequent after a transplant. Initially in the peri uh, operative period, immediately after transplant, yes you are advised a close follow up. But the close follow-up is only mandatory for the first three months and then uh, the follow-up becomes much uh, less and very infrequent. In terms of medication, no more need of phosphate binders, IV iron, erythropoietin, multiple antihypertensives. All you need is your immunosuppression and certain prophylactic medications. 
Fewer restriction in terms of meals, in fact I would say almost no restriction in terms of meals and no restriction in terms of the amount of water you have. If you ever get a chance to talk to our dialysis patients, they are miserable because the amount of water they are allowed in a day is no more than 500 ml. So it's almost criminal. The freedom to travel, you cannot expect somebody to travel with a thrice weekly dialysis schedule. So transplant gives them that advantage, especially young people the advantage to travel as much as they'd like and wherever they'd like, they just have to keep a track of their immunosuppressants. And what is often ignored in dialysis patients is the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, sexual dysfunction and loss of fertility, afflicting both men and women. And the first thing to resume after the graft starts functioning normally is the return of your uh, uh, sexuality, libido, as well as regaining fertility. In fact, after the first year of transplant, we even advise uh, uh, young female recipients that they can undergo, that they can get pregnant if they'd like to, which is not uh, a very, very infrequent on dialysis. And lastly, uh, money matters most to both you, me, and the patient. So a cost-benefit analysis. So transplant is a one-time cost, an investment for life. If you, this was a beautiful study that came out of PGI Chandigarh by Dr. Vivekanand Jha that showed that uh, whether the healthcare system bears the cost or the insurance company bears the cost or the patient has out of pocket expenditure, the average cost per dialysis session is around 4,200 rupees and even in Fortis it's just about the same. So assuming that a patient is put on thrice weekly schedule, the monthly cost of dialysis and this is just dialysis, no medications, no hospitalization is around 50,000 rupees a month which comes out to be 6 lakh rupees in a year. When you add to this the cost of erythropoietin, IV iron, AVF creation, access, infections, it comes out nearly around 8 lakh rupees a year. And since now we have 5 year survival rates and dialysis of 50%, nearly 50% people will end up spending 50 lakh rupees over 5 years on dialysis. Whereas when you compare it to transplant, at Fortis, I know it's a 6 lakh package for 7 days. Initial cost of immunosuppression is high because we need to keep the burden of immunosuppression higher in the first few months when the possibility of rejection is higher. And from third month onwards, when you start lowering the immunosuppression, the cost goes down to around 5,000 rupees a year. I have not included the cost of hospitalization in either of these scenarios. So you can compare 50 lakh rupees versus almost 7-8 lakh rupees. Here, the 6 lakh package is only the ABO compatible transplant. If you talk about incompatible, it will cost anywhere between 8 to 9 lakh rupees. Again, a huge bargain at any cost. And lastly, I'd like to end my uh, discussion with, it's not important that you refer patients early, what kind of patients you refer. It's also important where you are referring these patients because transplant outcomes are directly related to the performance of transplant center. So high performing centers, high uh, 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 centers which have a very high volume of transplant patients have significantly better outcomes than lower performing centers. So centers which have shown results should always be the preference for referring CKD patients because if you look at the 5 year survival rates of patients they are upwards of 90% whereas if you look at low performing centers they are somewhere between 80 to 90%. So refer patients to Fortis Vasankur. That's the crux. Thank you. that I think this was a very crystal clear presentation highlighting the superiority of kidney transplant. By doing a transplant, you are converting a sick individual into a healthy member of the society. And we have patients who have who are transplanted as children are now, you know, grown up adults, have families and caring for their parents also and supporting their parents. Whereas the patient stays on dialysis. He unfortunately is a parasite of the family. The family spends considerable amount of money, time, effort on the daily trip or I mean, you know, at least three times a week trip, you know, to the hospital. And frequent hospitalizations which are far higher in dialysis patients versus transplant patients. So if there are any questions, I think uh, we'll take in the end. We'll take in the end. We'll take Dear friends, my next batsman, the hero, my gastroenterologist friend, Dr. Shubham, 
we all know, he is with us for quite some time now and I have sent a few patients all satisfied. So I won't uh, uh, spend more time in introducing him because we all know him. His experience is of uh, more than 10 years in the field of gastroenterology and hepatology. And uh, I would like uh, you to clap that he has performed more than 1000 ERCPs. I, I have not seen any of them. And one black endoscopies and colonoscopies. Big hand. So, nothing uh, to say about him. Just I, I would like him to elaborate on his topic and he will know something new about his uh, field. Where is he? Dr. Shubham. Guys, clap for Shubham, yeah. He's our own. So, uh, a very good evening to everyone and I'm very happy and obliged to be here uh, on the other side of the table. And I think uh, everyone knows me and everyone here is almost a go-to friend of mine. And I would just like to uh, recall uh, an incident that happened in, uh, I think, 2019, January or February. I just joined the private sector after my DM and post-DM fellowship. And I met Renu ma'am at uh, Eros. And I remember uh, I asked her that, ma'am, I'm a student, do you remember me? And she was like, uh, maybe, and uh, I was like, obviously, ma'am, it's been a long time. And then I met uh, Chauhan sir, and Chauhan sir asked me to come on a Wednesday for a meeting. And the next Wednesday I was there and I asked sir that how can I invite myself to be here every Wednesday. And uh, he told me the procedure and I was referred to a few people and I followed the procedure. And after that, I think I've been here in the last five years every Wednesday. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a genuine uh, humbling experience of how many people have accepted me as one, the, one of their own. Uh, see, to be very honest, I'm still very junior to a lot of people whom I stand with. But if it was not the not the trust of people like you, because when I came to the uh, private practice sector, a lot of senior people told me that why will anyone see you? You don't you don't have a single uh, white hair on your head, and we are so seniors. And I think it is your trust which has excellent, uh, excellent person, excellent so person. Much. I'll start on that note. I'll talk about a very uh, classical uh, clinical approach on chronic diarrhea and uh, I'll discuss a case and I'll take, keep this clinical because all of us are clinicians. A 20 year old man presented to the OPD with a history of increased stool frequency for two years. There was a history of nocturnal diarrhea, large volume stools without blood or stool uh, without blood and, or mucus. It did not improve with any fasting. Uh, abdominal discomfort was there, weight loss, definite significant weight loss of 8 kgs in 6 months and there was anorexia and no fever. Uh, so, in a diagnostic approach to chronic diarrhea, the most important question is, is it actually diarrhea? The diarrhea is functional or organic? Is the diarrhea originating from the small bowel or, the, or painless? Is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory? Is it osmotic or secretory? And trust me, each one of these things has a definite implication on the diagnosis of the patient. So, this is, a, this is a classification which is no more followed, but yes, a clinic substitute goes out of the window, but any patient complaining of loose tools of a frequency more than two to three times a day in India for more than four weeks is considered to be chronic diarrhea, should be evaluated for the etiology. So, the first question is, the most common diarrhea we see in our OPD is a functional diarrhea. So we have to establish whether this diarrhea is organic or not. Always remember, functional diarrhea will be small in volume. Patient will hardly complain of any nocturnal stools. He will tell you that when, once I sleep, there is no episode that I have to wake up or go to the toilet to pass stools two to three times. There is absolutely no blood. There is no fecal incontinence. There is no weight loss. Weight loss means at least 10% body weight loss in the last six months which is considered significant weight loss. The intermittent frequency patient will report that I am normal on some days, but some days I have diarrhea. A onset is insidious and there is no history of dehydration or hypokalemia. So if you actually have significant weight loss, any malabsorption, continuous nocturnal symptoms, fecal incontinence, always remember that this is not functional diarrhea. Again, is the diarrhea from the small intestine or from the large intestine? So remember, 
the volume of the diarrhea is inversely proportional to the diameter of the intestine it origins from. So if it is a large volume diarrhea, patient says that once I go to the stool and I pass large volumes of diarrhea, then it originates from the small bowel. Because 7.5 liters of 9 liter of water in the GI tract is absorbed in the small intestine. Normally we think that large intestine absorbs more water. No, the small intestine absorbs 7.5 liters out of, out of 9 liters of water and only 1.4 liters of the rest 1.5 liter is absorbed by the large intestine. So small intestinal diarrhea would be large, large volume, large intestine would be small volume. A large intestine diarrhea cl classically involving the rectosigmoid will show you symptoms of urgency, frequency and tenismus. Tenismus is defined as a symptom where the patient has feeling of incomplete evacuation. He goes to toilet 30 times but says that I have not been able to empty my bowel. So there would be no malabsorption in a large bowel diarrhea. However, in a small bowel diarrhea, you might see excessive flatulence which suggests carbohydrate malabsorption, a pedal edema which suggests protein malabsorption, a greasy stools or a classical stools which float in the flush which is suggestive of fat malabsorption. So all these things in history, while talking to the patient, you can actually actually make uh, you will be, be very sure that whether this diarrhea, first question functional organic, second question small bowel, large bowel. So small bowel diarrhea with or without malabsorption will again tell you that whether what disease are you dealing with. So we are, we are not touching the patient yet. We are still in history. If the patient gives you features of small intestinal diarrhea with carbohydrate, fat and protein malabsorption, you are suffering with malabsorption syndrome, the different differential diagnosis, you can be a celiac disease, tropical flu, parasitic infections, Ipsid, intestinal meningitisia, SIBO, intestinal TB or trans disease. However, if there is no malabsorption, then it is a classic secretory diarrhea where you will find a bile acid or a, or a large volume secretory diarrhea, which is a different thing. So large bowel diarrhea, if it is a functional diarrhea, again I told you what a functional diarrhea means, you, have, you are for having a classical irritable bowel syndrome or a functional diarrhea. Organic diarrhea, large bowel with blood, classically inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, tuberculosis, CA colon, CA colon with diarrhea, Dr. Man will tell you better. Without, uh, without blood, organic large bowel diarrhea, classically seen in drug induced, like Olmesartan or a microscopic colitis, right? Is the diarrhea due to an inflammatory disease or a non-inflammatory disease? Again, this is the fourth question we are tackling. So remember, presence of postural symptoms, fever and joint pains, classically means that the patient is suffering from an inflammatory diarrhea. So what are inflammatory diarrhea? <coughs> what are non-inflammatory diarrhea? This be diarrhea mein, physician kata serum CRP karao or padao aata hai, inflammatory diarrhea hota hai. Okay? So what is the inflammatory diarrhea? A classical IBD would be an inflammatory diarrhea, I just tell you, TB, IBD, cross disease, ulcerative colitis, skipship. And other malabsorption syndrome which are located to the lumen, celiac disease, tropical spru, GRTSS, apital agotinemia, SIBO would be a classical non-inflammatory diarrhea. So again painful or painless, so if the patient says that I have diarrhea organic and painful, it means that the disease has entered the third layer of the wall. So there are four layers, the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis propria and the serosa. The pain will only happen if it enters the muscularis propria. So painful diarrhea will only be if it's a stricture in a TB or a cross disease or an ulcerative colitis. Right? Classical mucosal malabsorption like tropical spru, uh, celiac disease won't cause any pain. But these stricturing diseases which enter the muscularis propria, uh, tuberculosis, Crohn's disease, hemorrhage, pimples, they would be classically causing pain to the patient. Okay, so the last question would be osmotic secretory. There are no classical osmotic secretory diarrhea. The only osmotic diarrhea we need to remember clinically is a lactose malabsorption. So patient with age loses the ability of digesting lactose, develop primary lactose intolerance. Otherwise, it is mostly a mixed diet. Okay, features of malabsorption as I told you. I'll just, uh, so these are very important again, vitamin deficiencies, symptoms and signs you will find on examination. So patient having heart failure, patient having riboflavin deficiency with glossitis, celiitis, angulostomatitis, niacin deficiency presenting with diarrhea, photosensitive dermatitis, dementia, pyridoxin deficiency presenting with anemia. Pyridoxin deficiency leading to anemia classically refractory because people try Iron, people try B12, then also it's a problem. Folic acid deficiency, macrophilic anemia, B12 deficiency, megalolastic anemia. So coming back to the case. So it was a 20 year old man with history of increased stool frequency for 2 years. Friends of nocturnal diarrhea, large volume stools without blood mucus, does not improve with fasting, abdominal discomfort, significant weight loss. So now I know if this is chronic diarrhea, patient has organic, chronic diarrhea because of presence of weight loss and malabsorption. The origin is small. 
flower because of large volume and uh, presence of malabsorption and non osmotic because it is not improving with fasting so there is nothing, nothing, nothing coming from outside so the differential diagnosis and there is so and a very important thing I don't think this patient has pain so if this patient has no pain then I am ruling out IBD I am ruling out TB classically right because 60 to 90 percent patients with intestinal TB will present with pain because of the stricturing and the ulcerative nature of the intestinal tuberculosis so again I think this would be a mucosal malabsorption disease so uh, again uh, coming back to the same thing these are subtle subtle markers which will help you a celiac disease generally does not have thrombocytopenia right iron deficiency classically in celiac disease and iron deficiency does not present with thrombocytopenia it presents with thrombocytosis so it is an indirect marker low alkaline malabsorption and okay so uh, the, again very important thing chronic diarrhea malabsorption patient malnourished always remember patient can be immunocompromised the immunocompromised HIV associated chronic diarrhea most common cause cryptosporidium parvum otherwise azospora belli are very common these are acid fast uh, organism can be, caught, can be caught easily on a acid fast uh, stain like uh, modified acid fast stain D xylose obsolete test today fecal fat obsolete test today Sudan 3 I don't want to go on this again serum serological test would be very helpful Re always remember thyrotoxicosis presents like with diarrhea weight loss ok so patient coming to the OPD 16 year old female having diarrhea, having weight loss, having three colonoscopies done by everyone. So if I am a gastroenterologist, I should not forget I did MD medicine. I should be very clear that a chronic diarrhea should be evaluated for thyroid function. HIV serology, celiac serology, immunoglobin pro profile and serum B12 levels. Right? So celiac serology, the most common test is IgA and TTTG as you know. 10% patients of celiac disease can have selective IgA deficiency. In those cases, we use a IgG antibody which is IgG anticlinic. Uh, this is an endoscopic examination, classical small bowel diarrhea, this is scalloping of folds, very beautifully seen here. This, this is the scalloping, you see, the fold is scalloped. It is classical shiny mucosal granularity, abnormal mucosa, the, the biopsy forceps used for biopsy. So this is how we see here. This is classical celiac disease, spot diagnosis used in a DM exit exam to see. So again, this is a celiac proof, very classic scalloping, very classic scalloping of folds. This is the mucosal granularity again. And this will reverse very fast once a patient is on 12 weeks of gluten free diet. Right, this is a normal tall mucosa you will see on a biopsy. So, coming back to the early academics of first prof, second prof. And this is the crypt villus distortion and crypt hyperplasia with intra epithelial lymphocytes increased in classical. These are the lymphocytes which have increased intra epithelially. This is classically celiac disease. So, uh, so mucosal, mucosal histology is very helpful. So a D2 biopsy will always help you diagnose a, a chronic diarrhea, the etiology. And again, there are multiple things which help us to be diagnosed. Things which today I think are not very common for a frankly uh, clinical practitioner, but yes, important. <laughs> so again, very important test again would be a CT enterography. I would like to get this done in a patient uh, suspected of any kind of malabsorption, any kind of ulcerostrictive lesion, it will help me tell that whether I am suspecting a cross disease in the small bowel which is classically involving the jejunum, IVM, whether I am dealing with ulcerative colitis, whether I am dealing with a celiac disease, a tropical flu, what is exactly going on in total length without putting an enteroscope in. Again, so CT enterography becomes a wonderful test for evaluation of malabsorption. So large bowel diarrhea classically seen majority patients always remember irritable bowel syndrome is what we see almost daily presence of cyclical pain abdomen patient is having diarrhea but there are no nocturnal symptoms there is no weight loss patient is having on the other hand majority of them are gaining weight this is classically fit into this for clinical practice always remember you don't need to send an IBS to a gastroenterologist you just need four tests you can get it done, done in your clinic as a clinical practitioner if a CBC is normal and if these four C's you can write down this is from any GM. If your CBC is normal, your CRP is normal, your celiac profile is normal and your fecal calcutectin is normal. 99 to 100% this is a functional diarrhea. Even if you do an endoscopy, you do anything, 
this patient will not get better unless and until the underlying gut brain axis and the serotonin disturbances are tackled and classical counseling of the patient is done. So even if I am a gastroenterologist and I forget that this is a functional diarrhea and I need to talk to this guy for half an hour, understand and then go to the root cause and inform the primary physician that I don't need this patient, you can tackle him. That would be the most important thing which I can do for the betterment of the patient. So again coming for coloroscopy, sigmoidoscopy, this will help me in if there is a classical large bowel organic diarrhea. These are things which help with the coloroscopy. So uh, ulcerative colitis, classical disease, starts from rectum, continuous, confluent, superficial, very well managed with multiple modalities. Cross disease again, difficult to manage as compared to ulcerative colitis, but yes, very well managed by gastroenterologists. These are cases which a physician fails to like manage completely and we can come uh, particularly into the picture. Dr. Shubham, yes. the last power play. Okay, sir. Sir, I am done. Actually, I am summarizing. Coming back to the patient. So this was the patient who had anemia, IGIG DDD was positive, I showed the upper GI endoscopy, wrote the biopsy of celiac disease and we closed the case with celiac disease, gluten free diet. This last thing, this is the largest study done in India about the most common cause of chronic diarrhea and malabsorption. This was done by Dr. Govind Makhari and Dr. Vineet Abuja, Ames, New Delhi. Celiac disease is the most common cause of chronic diarrhea with malabsorption in North India. 1 in 69 patients in North India have celiac disease, some are diagnosed, some are not diagnosed. It is overtly present, somebody of us might have it and we don't, might not know it. Tropical flu is the second most common, classically more common in South India than North India. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, end my slide here. Thank you so much. I hope I made some sense with chronic diarrhea. And, uh, Thank you so much. So, question is that. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, our last and most important speaker, because I am a surgeon, so I will favor a surgeon. So, Dr. Himal Kumar, who is the director of GI and Normal Access and Bariatric Surgery, he is working at Fortis Hasimpun Hospital. Uh, he has experienced the last 15 years of surgeries, more than 15 years of surgeries. He has performed more than 20,000 surgeries. Uh, he expertised in laparoscopic surgery, more and more over interest in uh, uh, minimal excess uh, hernia surgeries, bariatric surgeries and hollow visceral surgeries, basically colorectal surgeries. And uh, he's a good friend of us and we'll be delighted to listen to him. It was a wonderful talk by all the early presenters who have enlightened us, especially my dear friend Dr. Shubham. And, uh, Dr. Uh, team of Dr. Sanjay Gulati and Dr. Vishan Saxena. This will be the last talk for the night and I know everybody is feeling hungry. So before we jump to the food and question answers, Dr. Hemant will enlighten us with some uh, uh, colorectal cancers and how we can deal with them and how they present with us and what we can do as a surgeon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for this uh, privileged presence in front of you all. Absolutely pleasure seeing this uh, crowd of elite uh, members out here and to know that you have been running this forum for the last 862 weeks continuous without a break is just amazing. I feel myself quite unfortunate not to be a part of this uh, elite group. I hope someday I will be a part of this group on a regular basis. So, I, I would just uh, you know, start my presentation. Uh, Though I have said that diary has a presentation of uh, colorectal cancers, but on this day, I would like to rather talk about colorectal cancers. Where do we start? Uh, where do we stand today? The commonest uh, cancers in India are still the lung cancer, oral cavity cancers, followed by uh, breast, cervix, and then in GIT we have the esophageal cancer, mainly because of the coronavirus, but colorectal carcinomas are on the rising trend. When we talk of any surgery, we always need to know about the anatomy. Anatomy was one subject during our uh, MBBS course, we used to wonder why ever it was taught. The beauty of this subject, one gets to learn when they come out to know a part of surgery. Now, colon, as we all know, starts from cecum, and then we have the ascending, then we have the transverse colon, then we have the descending, sigmoid, and we have the rectum, the other one. So, uh, talking about the incidence, it's quite common 
world over, uh, it's the second most uh, common uh, malignancy with about 18,000 dying per annum in UK. The mortality is quite high in other countries as well. And most of the time it is always attributed to the westernization, especially the diet forum, especially the, uh, eating the red meat. And uh, in, in fact, if we see, it's more common in Australia, Western Europe, uh, Southern Europe, Northern America. When we still consider uh, India, it's still on the lower side and uh, our incidence is about uh, 4.3 and in uh, females it is 3.4. Uh, the rates are quite low, probably because of our traditional way of diet. That is what we talk about uh, when we talk about colonic cancer. And in India, it's you know, the rectal carcinoma is more than the colonic carcinoma. However, the rising trend has been there in the last few decades with uh, more and more cases coming up in front, probably because of more investigations and uh, early diagnosis. Now, uh, again, another thing also has been found out that in immigrants of in, uh, India into the US and UK, this incidence is on the rising trend. More and more new cases have been found out. In India, again, we had a recent this one that uh, colonic cancer is quite high in Goa, probably because of the eat of, uh, eating of red meat, and that's again contributed to the dietary habits. And uh, the articles keep coming, uh, this is an article from the Olympian Institute of uh, Medical Science where they have said uh, still though it is there, it is comparatively less than those of the East Asian uh, countries. What leads to colonic cancer? As usual, there is a familiar history, healthy diet, lifestyle, uh, uh, more of uh, red meat, obesity, high calorie intake, diet, processed food genetic factors like familial adenomatosis, polyposis, and we have HNPCC. Now, usually, if we go more into the etiopathogenesis, it is the adenoma, carcinoma sequence that happens again at the level of uh, genetic. And this we have the adenomatous, hematomatous polyps that change into cancers, ulcerative colitis, and we have the familial cancer uh, disease. Now, most of the time, what has changed is screening. Screening for colorectal cancers now are in a very high trend. With most of the primary health care uh, centers doing tests to find an early detection or uh, detect early the cancers. One fecal occult blood test even today has value. We have chronoscopies, we have sigmoidoscopies, uh, barium contrast enema in uh, places where you don't have uh, CCT, that is the contrast uh, uh, CT scans. And with the PET CT now into the picture, things have changed dramatically. CA is not a diagnostic, but definitely a prognostic marker in cases of uh, colorectal cancer. So what is recommended is, at the age of 50, an annual uh, fecal occult blood and uh, sigmoidoscopy every five years. And you have, uh, where the centers are not available, I mean, you can go for a double contrast barium enema at every five years. Colonoscopy every 10 years if previous examination is negative. In case of familial or hereditary cancers, the screening starts as early as 20 years of age. Most of the time, the presentation is bleeding per rectum. Second most common is change in bowel pattern over a period of time. You may have an altered uh, uh, constipation followed by diarrhea. Sometimes spurious diarrhea is another uh, way how the presentation is there. There is a general discomfort in the abdomen, chronic constipation, constant fatigue, acute intestinal obstruction or a palpable lump. They usually say right-sided cancers present with anemia while left-sided cancers present more with obstruction. The workup usually includes the complete blood investigations. We do the tumor markers for more for the prognosis. Then we have the other uh, investigation. I mean most of the time what has happened is now PET-CT has taken over all it all of it followed by colonoscopy and biopsy that again yields to it. The type, most of the time, it's an adenocarcinoma arising from the colon. So it could be well differentiated, moderately well differentiated or poorly differentiated. The spread, usually local lymphatic bloodstream and transperitone. So most of the time, what influences the outcome is the stage. The early, the better. And that early detection can also always be possible by mass screening. The biology of the disease, we have so many markers, immunochemistry chemistry now that adds up to the markers uh, of the cancer which now predict what, come, uh, what will be the outcome on what chemotherapy can be given to the patient. 
the adequacy of the treatment obviously the factor remains uh, what what happens whether it's surgical whether it is chemo or whether it is a radiotherapy these are the few pictures of how colonic cancers look in the in the white thing there if you can make out that is the area of the cancers and this is the cancer the rectosigmoid cancer with the most of perforation out there This was a specimen of the total colectomy was done in one of those genetic disorders with the multiple uh, polyposis staging. We have Duke staging, Asler's curve staging, and now we have the TNM staging. I don't want to go into that. So, what has changed over a period of time? How the surgeon's approach has changed? Now, we are more talking of laparoscopic and a robotic approach to colonic cancers, and it is an evident way. There was always a uh, loggerheads with uh, people who do open surgery versus laparoscopic surgery, each saying benefit. Or the other. So there has been a controversy which goes on. Only thing I can say is, as a laparoscopic surgeon, that we can deliver the same amount of, you know, uh, e at the end of a surgery as an open surgery does. Plus, giving the patients the benefit of laparoscopic surgery. So in the early 1990s, an attempt was done to move on from open surgeries to minimal access surgery, and the growing evidence is more towards laparoscopic surgery. Now, what's the advantage? Per se, as fewer perioperative complications, faster postoperative recovery, less comorbidity, less postoperative pain, good exposure with wide viewing because of you know uh, 10x magnification of the anatomical structures. Now, what is the limitations when we talk of laparoscopic surgery? There is definitely a longer curve. Now, you know, there's always a dictum: you don't become a laparoscopic surgeon unless, of course, you have done some few open surgeries. Because if laparoscopy doesn't work, you need to know how to go in and do the right job. Oncological adequacy. So, almost all cancers have to be taken care of with oncological principles. You don't deal with it any other way just because you are doing a laparoscopic or a robotic surgery. Now, another factor which has been commonly discussed is port side recurrence, almost always blamed because of the use of carbon dioxide where you know you let it out, there are possibility of uh, port side recurrence and definitely an equation where they say ki there is uh, metastatic spread more in cases of uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery. But what does the evidence say? The evidence, open surgery's morbidity is about 10 to 20 percent and in lab to 17 percent. Lymph node dissection, definitely similar. Recurrence at the end of five years, six percent local, six percent local as in laparoscopic also. Survival equally uh, good. Cost effective definitely overall better. Quality of life better than laparoscopy and mean operative time definitely in the good centers better. Now even Sages, that's one of the endoscopic guidelines. Uh, they always say they now recommended for all uh, you know colonic cancers and there is level 1 evidence when we talk of this and grade A recommendation. So definitely they will follow the standard oncological principles like I have told before that is the ligation of the articular supply, adequate proximal and distal margin and appropriate lymphatic technique. They say minimum 12 lymph nodes need to be extracted if you feel your surgery is adequate. And then for the contagious spread that is the post site approach. An open approach if block laparoscopic end block for these uh, four uh, lesion cannot be uh, performed safely. And if there is, you know, preferably avoid tumor perforation you know, that can lead to uh, metastasis or the spread, local at least. Prevention of wound implants, so extraction through either backs or you can cover the pores and get it done. Wound irrigation has been recommended. So this is basically how we go about doing the anatomical basis itself. So whenever there is a uh, tumor in the cecum and ascending colon, we perform the right hemicolectomy, that's the picture A. In picture B, we have a tumor which is there in the hepatic flexure where we perform the extended right hemicolectomy. We go and take most of the transverse colon. In case of uh, transverse uh, colon uh, growths, we can perform transverse colectomy or we can go for an extended uh, uh, hemicolectomy. Whenever there is a growth in the descending colon, we perform the left hemicolectomy and again uh, when it comes to the sigmoid, we can either perform a sigmoid colectomy. So all based on classical principles of oncology. So I just want to say in brief that towards the end, the laparoscopic approach towards GI oncology surgery has been immensely beneficial to the patient and would definitely be recommended. Thank you.
लाइट जला देना सो जो भी टाइम वी हैव सम क्वेश्चन आई वुड लाइक टू से अबाउट एन इंटरेस्टिंग केस व्हिच वी हैड डन विद डॉक्टर संजीव गुलाटी ऑब्वियसली हैव बीन आवर मेंटर सो दिस केस वाज अ जेंटलमैन अबाउट 47 इयर्स हु हैड कम फॉर बिरियाटिक सर्जरी विद बीएमआई 43.3 विद डायबिटीज एज अ कोमोबिलिटी so he underwent a bariatric surgery uh, gastric bypass post surgery 2 years later he is completely fit diabetes under nutrition not on any medications he is come back to a bmi of 24 chhoda hai now he's got his son who is about 160 kilos 19 years old for a bariatric surgery on his work up he was a bariatrician of the अरे बंद कर दो इसको इसके अगर कवर रख दो 19 ईयर ओल्ड बॉय सो वी ऑब्वियसली ड्यूरिंग द वर्क अप सेंट इट टू डॉक्टर गुलाटी तो डॉक्टर गुलाटी वर्क टीम अप एंड ड्यूरिंग हिज वर्क अप ही वाज ही वाज फाउंड टू हैव अ एंड स्टेज रीनल डिजीज नाउ द इक्वेशन वाज व्हाट टू डू नाउ whether the son undergoes a bariatric surgery first or whether the son undergoes a renal transplant first obviously boss means so the best part about this entire surgery was the fact who would give him the donation of the kidney and you won't even believe it was his dad who gave him the kidney a guy who would have otherwise previously contraindicated because he was a diabetic okay and now after 2 years of this bariatric surgery he was no more diabetic he was off this one he was worked up extensively and he has the one who underwent and in uh, bariatric surgery he now gave his son the kidney he underwent the renal transplant post renal transplant is creating excellent state at this one we performed the bariatric surgery after 6 months the boy is doing extremely well in us continuing his studies and now in the job there and you know yeah that was actually a landmark case and that's just to you know put it in the proper perspective the father had come to us about a few years back and being a diabetic we had actually rejected him for a as a kidney donor and told him that you cannot donate kidney to your son because you are a diabetic and so following the bariatric surgery the diabetes was reversed but we were not satisfied so i told him that and those are early stages said that you know the only way we can take you up is that you unless we have a histology so we actually did a biopsy and this person absolutely had a normal glomerular histology we were saying that you are going to donate to your son who's going to you know, require a response in time life so either you know, you better be a good donor and obviously there is always this uh, feeling that you should you know the pure one you should make a healthy person say so now thanks to the bariatric surgery as you can see the later on the son also underwent a bariatric surgery so that is the miracle of uh, bariatric surgery in uh, modern medicine uh, do we do we feel that uh, he will also this gentleman donate to his son next time <laughs> sir uh, 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 sir uh, sir what what uh, since uh, the Uh, ESRD has started early, uh, so I will ask my just one or two questions. Uh, has there been any improvement in harvesting the donor kidney, maybe cadaveric or living, uh, over the time? So I came across that there are costly affairs, but they they can harvest. So first and foremost, I think you know cadaveric transplantation is one where there is a lot of effort. We in North India. Are in the most primitive world, you know. Where our donation rates are shameful. So as a company, yeah. so I think uh, there is uh, a lot of excitement you know, from, uh, on this front. But now obviously there is more problems. Even when it comes, uh, the cost is going to be an issue. But India again has the highest world traffic accident rate in the entire world. so uh, road traffic accidents are you know they are the prime source of kidney donors because you have clean uh, people away from sepsis at the same time the paradox is we have the lowest organ donation rates so most of these organs are going waste they are going into you know they are being wasted so again another plea again just to you know sensitize everyone please go back We'll give you. We'll send you a poster, or in one of the forums, we'll email you. And please email the. I I can email it to Sushil, and Sushil can email it. Just get a print out, and please post it in your clinic. Do it. Can you do it? Very good. I guess my last question is about uh, some of the uh, ongoing problems which had led to the CKD in the patient, and he is now getting uh, 
uh, is a recipient is getting someone donating him a kidney. So what about those ongoing problems like diabetes, hypertension? So do you think uh, hypertension could be a uh, cause or result of it? And how to in the donor? Yeah, in the donor. No, in the donor. No. In the recipient. So how do we tackle those problems? Because the newer uh, kidney also will face the same problem. So yeah, you know, uh, if you look at data in kidney, it's a very good question. So we are talking now about problems once the patient has got a transplant. So obviously the effort, you know, in our country, you get a one chance. It's, it's a once in a lifetime donation, you, you need to preserve the kidney function. And besides immunosuppression, good blood pressure control has found, been found to be the single most important factor that prolongs kidney survival. So blood pressure control no doubt has to be meticulous. We are not happy with 130, 135, 120 by 80. The lower the blood pressure, the better it is. If there are two individuals who has got, one has got 135, one has got 120, the 120 donor uh, kidney patient is going to live longer. So you can't get away from good blood pressure control, good sugar. If he's a diabetic, yes, diabetes damages kidney. And um, you have to, again, manage the diabetes very meticulously. Targeting HbA1c is as close to normal as possible, 6 to 6.5. Possibly 6.5 is very weak, you know. And a lot of these are medications for diabetes, not of our medications for hypertension also. So let's be honest about it, those are side effects. But these are, you know, things we can take it up later. But both these things need to be monitored very closely in the kidney transplant patient. And I, I think uh, it's very nice of you, Dr. Kalra, to bring it out uh, with, uh, because of constraints of time in him. Get into all this. <laughs> Dr. Sanjeev, uh, you, men you mentioned about uh, a very low road, uh, lay, uh, rate of don donation in, yeah. in, in our country. Oh. Uh, but the problem is that it varies from state to state. In, in South India, in, in, in states like Chennai, yeah. there is a very good uh, donation. donation. Yeah. And Sanjeev worked in Ahmedabad Again. where they are doing the maximum number of transplants. What is the reason for that? I think the reason is really some Really social, I think. We need to have uh, more awareness, create more awareness in the society. Because after all, it's the same country, as you rightly said, by one part. Even in North, you know, Chandigarh has the highest solvent donation rate in the entire North. The Indian territory of Chandigarh, their organ donation rate is about 10 times all other cities, 10 times better. So I think as a community, you know, we have to grow up. So, as, think, as we have my, to, my we suggestion have, is that as a leading nephrologist and as president of uh, uh, Indian Society of Nephrology, I think uh, let's work on that idea of putting these posters in every physician's clinic. Yeah, yeah, that's what, because we have been since trying to, you know, put, uh, write articles in newspapers and all, but I think, you know, it's not a one man's and more often the learning has been that this organ donation rate picks up when people take it up. Yes. You know, if, if you say, the if, see, as a nephrologist, we are all interested parties. You can say we are biased. Somebody may say, you know, he is promoting organ donation so that his, his own work picks up. So people treat, it, treat us with suspect. It's natural. I'm not, I'm not getting offended. Nobody should feel offended. But when you as leaders, as respectable physicians in the society, who have got nothing to do with organ donation or organ transplantation, when you tell your patients or when your patients are sitting in your clinic waiting, you know, and rather than if they read something interesting and you know, nowadays it's very simple. You just go on the online and you can pledge your organs. So with a link that, you know, this is how you pledge your organs, maybe things might change. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first talk, coming to the first talk, uh, Dr. Mangla sir, Dr. Prashant is not here and we've been practically living in a gas chamber. Uh, since October in Delhi. Uh, sir, you have been getting cases and we have been getting cases with chronic persistent cough. Uh, sir, what are the, uh, I would say, the red signals that we should suspect that it is not the usual cough or related to air pollution or, or uh, the, uh, all these issues and uh, uh, there, there is something that is required. So, how do you start investigating a case of cough which is more than which has been there for more than a month or four weeks. Exactly, you know, pollution is for all. 
you know, every patient who is coughing will commit the whole daily pollution filter. Pollution is for all the members of the house. The one individual gets caught. Usually these are again allergic coughs. There are there is certain irritants in that atmosphere and these patients start coughing on them. They are kind of cough variant asthma. It may be a first episode or it may be a recurrent episode. I tell these patients when they are coughing, give them short course of steroids and inhalers. Dr. Singh sir, Dr. Singh sir, please, if you don't mind. They get better. So I tell them, still I am not labeling you as an asthmatic. If in the next year, around the same time, you get cough again, then it, it is probably you have some irritable receptors and you have a kind of an asthma. And you need to treat them with inhalers and short course steroids. And SOS cough syrup. You know, uh, you, they are all allergic coughs. Sir, what there may be different uh, allergens in the atmosphere. It may be pollutants, it may be pollen, it may be something. Sir, for our physician friends, what are the investigation modalities that you go through? Usually, uh, you know, you do a chest x-ray, you do CBC, you do IgE, not too many investigations. And uh, the, usually the uh, diagnosis is made by history. You know, if he has no toxemia, he just coughing, coughing, coughing worse at night, coughing, and, and, or he says that exposure to a particular thing gives rise to cough. So that is how you have to make a diagnosis. I don't think too many investigations are required for this. We can do a pulmonary function test which may be normal in a cough variant asthma or it may show obstruction and reversal. That's sir, Mangla, I, I like to... Sir, hey, my third part was what are the red signals where you would say, okay, this is, doesn't look to be a normal cough. We need to investigate this guy in detail. For example, I would say hemoptosis, episode of hemoptosis. Or if the character of the cough changes suddenly. Sir, your comment. Suddenly. You know, if somebody is not having any history of asthma, out of the blue cough starts, then it's not getting better. <coughs> if it is associated with toxemia, you would like to rule out, you know, any pneumonia, any tuberculosis. And at times, if an elderly person or 40 plus is a smoker, just taking an X-ray, you will find that there is a, a speculated nodule in the malignancy. And I'll give you an example that I was sent a child uh, by a pediatrician. That this cough is not getting better. Uh, I think he has developed tuberculosis. So this child came to me and uh, when I saw the x-ray, I was told that there is a calcified lesion, but I felt it looked like a tooth. So I asked, uh, I asked, did you have a, some tooth? The mother said, ha ha, doctor, sir, gira tha, wo mil gaya tha. Then baby said, that child said, nahi, mummi nahi mila. So in fact, it was a tooth which got aspirated and the cause of, and it was removed by bronchoscopy and uh, the child's cough got better. So you should always uh, suspect a foreign body also. It may be a uh, normal looking x-ray, but it may be a hyperinflated upper lobe and lower organ obstruction. Uh, so if you, uh, the cough out of the blue, it's coming, associated features, you start with a chest x-ray. But more often than not, energy cough you are able to pick up with. The cough is a main, main problem. It is in the night. Uh, and uh, you see, there is no other toxicity, there is no great toxicity, it's an well. Sir, do you have to give these people of allergic cough a short course of steroid also at times? Short of that, they don't get better. Okay. Of that, they don't what get does this short course constitute and what is the yeah, dose? I actually, I give them, an uh, adult patient, I give some inhaler, I give, give some water yogas, and give a short course, short term day, only 5 days of 20 mg bicellon. Uh, only for five days. But if they say they'll come and say, the doctor initially to Pangali Pantin to Thi Kogia. But now the cough has recovered. Then we give them a tapering dose of 20 for five days, 10 for five days, five for five days. Most of them settle down there. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sain has a question. Wonderful. Dr. Shuri, ask you one thing. Sorry. So, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. John. Let me congratulate all the speakers for having done a wonderful job and they were extremely erudite in their presentation, all four of them. And a special shout out to Sanskriti for having done it so well in front of your father. I think you can take a bow. So, my question is uh, uh, two sets, small sets, very fast. First, related to the 
the kidney aspect part of it. Dr. Gulati and Dr. Sanskriti, uh, quickly, uh, what are the laws governing transplantation for the donor's perspective? We have so much of, uh, you know, uh, problems in the press which we see. Who all can donate? And lastly, uh, with respect to cadaveric transplantation, what are the success rates? So with regards to your first question, uh, so legally the uh, human organ, the human organ uh, transplant act uh, as of 2011 allows first degree relatives which is uh, defined as your wife, uh, mother, father and your uh, children yeah. and in the case of brother, sister, siblings. Uh, these people can be allowed to donate without any uh, excessive uh, documentation, you know, apart from the legal formalities which yeah. need to be fulfilled. That's clear. Yeah. In case of children, even grandparents are uh, uh, considered eligible for donation. Uh, that is left up to the nephrologist to see the GFR, etc. Medically, if they are fit, even grandparents can donate to uh, grandkids. As far as, yes sir? So, I mean, if none of them are suitable, as per the Indian laws, a second person or somebody tangentially related may yes, or may not can, be available. Yes, they can. But on, uh, the uh, second degree relatives can come into play, but that would require some bit of documentation, some legal, uh, extra legal formalities, because it becomes more difficult to prove the relationship as uh, you know you go down the hierarchy of family tree. So uh, even paternal uncles, but is that very cumbersome, Dr. So the documentation part might take a little bit of time because legal frame, we have to do everything within the legal framework. If we go outside that, uh, it will become headlines. So it is easier with first degree relatives. It is slightly more difficult as you go down the family tree. But if you are able to prove the relationship, uh, there is there is absolutely uh, no, uh, no contraindication from our side uh, medically or even legally uh, that paternal and maternal uncles and aunts cannot do it. That is one part. There is a legal committee of the government. Right. So that has to be no way it is involved in uh, right. accepting. Or, so our rule comes once they give an approval. Yeah. Or prior to we just see the medical aspect. The legal aspect is handled by an authorization committee. Uh, which, if it, it's a first degree relative, it's a hospital authorization committee which is from in house. And it's a second degree relative. It's an external committee which is constituted by the health and family members. Uh, quickly said regarding the success of cadaveric transplants and uh, incompatible, the ABU incompatible transplants. So I think I would have still got the best long term of life. Yeah. If you have a choice going for a life donor. There's a mic sir. If you have a choice going for a living donor. Yeah. Uh, category transplantation success rates are not bad. They are still in the range of 80 percent compared to 94 percent with the life donor. Long term survival is definitely better with the living donor. Even if compatible transplant, yes. Uh, inferior rates about 85, 80, 80 to 85 percent, but they are still better than Clarice. All these, whether it's a cadaveric donor, whether it's an incompatible donor, whether it's a living donor, you are far, far away, as Sanchiti already showed you, as your outcomes in dialysis are just the 30 percent, interestingly, are the US outcomes. Indian outcomes, she already said, we don't have good Indian data. Indian dialysis is a suboptimal dialysis often performed in. You know, B-grade uh, dialysis units by where nephrologists often don't go. I mean, it's by technician where people go for the cheapest dialysis unit. Yeah. Survivors are anywhere between you know 10 to 15 percent, not more than that. <coughs> Thank you, sir. And last question and coming to Dr. Mangla sir, since Dr. Prashant is not here. Uh, we do see and tend to overlook uh, cases of psychogenic cough which do happen in our cases. I mean, I had a patient who kept on complaining of some kind of irritation and cough for two years almost. Transpired that uh, that patient had some family even two years ago, which caused these things and he had gone through every pathologist. Sleep problems, other problems related to depression. Put on antidepressants, the patient's cough reduced. So, uh, I don't know, I mean, that might have been one of these odd cases, but uh, in your experience, sir, what do you, uh, what, what would you comment upon? I don't see them too often. 
Yeah. But you know these people, because you will get an idea that patient has a psychological problem. Yeah. Then, uh, it is not difficult to find out. Absolutely. And these patients we are able to send them to uh, psychiatrist studies. So we will investigate them, we will do yeah. their test, they will do the EFT. But usually by the history we are able to gauge. Some of in my assessment last five six years, I see quite a few of them related to the other comorbidities and the physical comorbidities. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I would like to address my question to Dr. Hemant and Dr. Shubha. You both talk about the area. Uh, and you talked about functional and organic diarrhea. I want to know uh, at what stage uh, of my dealing with a case of diarrhea should I refer this case to Dr. Himan and not to you? So I think uh, he will have to go through me. Because so the channel is through Dr. Shubham. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not, 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 so, uh, not jokingly, but actually, no, no. Uh, we want to, to diagnose CA colon. You can, add, as a physician, get a serum CA done and that might be high and you can send the patient to Dr. Raman. But he'll need a tissue diagnosis for uh, that, he'll need a colonoscopy and for that he'll send it to me. So I think uh, once you have uh, once you have any recent onset change in bowel habits or blood in stools above the age of 45 to 50, it is somewhere a physician should be, not be looking after this patient. So, why so I can draw that line there. So why I have uh, asked that question in the remember? Uh, yes sir. I was about to come to that. 62 62 year old guy who, was, who used to walk with you so 3 years ago in Rose, Rose Garden came to me with constipation sir. And one episode of blood in stools I asked him to get a sigmoidoscopy. And he was very uh, adamant not to get it done. He had a son-in-law who was my neighbour in Jeevan Mihar Shivale. And uh, three weeks down the line when sir actually told them that I am not going to talk to you, you talk to about any time. We did it and we got a sigmoid colon, recto sigmoid, large growth. And patient had recent onset blood in school once, just alternate diarrhea constipation. And I was after his life that see recent onset, this age, uh, scopy is indicated. And, uh, and we proved that he has uh, cancer. Yeah, he had adeno carcinoma rectus. Do you remember a 14 year old boy from my village who had malabsorption syndrome? Yeah, yeah. He was proven CKI disease after that. Tropical, tropical screw. Yeah, yeah. Tropical yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Anemia and bitter deficiency. And, 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 and fatty and yeah. general malaise. Yes. And general malaise. Yes. 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 5.2 was the hemoglobin when he had. So this, these diarrhea, they can be very dicey and you have to be very careful. As physicians, there is a there is a line beyond which we are not able to think, you know, uh, 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 about anything, and therefore that is the time when uh, Shubham must be uh, consulted. Right. Yeah.